Okay, so let's start. Uh, any questions from the previous class? Right, so let's quickly recall what we saw in the previous class. We were looking at algorithms for linear classification. Right? In, in particular, we were trying to find a way of implementing the ERM for linear classifiers in RD as efficiently as possible. Uh, and we saw that we can, we can formulate this in the following manner, that is uh, effectively finding an ERM that minimizes the margin can be framed as uh, effectively maximizing the minimum margin. And that, as we saw, can be posed as the following hard SVM problem, which is to find the minimum of the two norm or, to, or the two norm squared of A subject to the constraint that yi times ai a transpose xi minus b is greater than or equal to 1 for all i. So, uh, in other words, you try, so the two norm of a effectively or 1 by the two norm of a would, would actually correspond to the margin and or the minimum margin and this, these constraints ensure that all of the points are classified correctly. So today we'll see why the support vector machine classifier is called support vector machine, what support vectors are. And, and then we'll also look at maybe a simple implementation of this. And we'll see the case where the points, the, the training set that we're given is not linearly separable. In other words, we'll deal with the non-realizable assumption. Right. So, um, is there anybody here who hasn't taken the convex optimization course? Okay, one. There's only one point that I'll need from convex optimization, and those are the KKT conditions, right? Uh, so, so let's again look at the optimization problem that we are interested in. So recall that the hard SVM problem. is the following optimization problem. So you find argmin overall A in Rd, B in R of the two norm of A squared subject to the constraints that yi times A transpose xi minus B is greater than or equal to 1 for all i. So i equal to 1, 2, 3 up to n. So we have n training. So basically, we are given a training set, which is x1, y1 up to xn, yn, where each xi is a point in d-dimensional space and each yi is in plus or minus 1. We are labeling them plus 1 and minus 1. So the hard SVM problem essentially corresponds to this nice convex optimization problem. And if you recall from the convex optimization course, as long as we have a nice smooth convex optimization problem, this satisfies strong duality. And we can solve this by solving for the KKT conditions. So let's write down the KKT conditions and see what that tells us about the solution to this problem. So, the KKT conditions are the following. In order to do this, let's first write down the Lagrangian.
So in the optimization problem, I have n constraints. All of them are linear constraints. And so the Lagrangian consists of the variables over which we are optimizing. At the same time, we need Lagrange multipliers, one for each of these one of one for each of these constraints. So let me call the Lagrange multipliers to be lambda 1, lambda 2, up to lambda n. And I'll denote that by a single vector lambda. So this is simply a linear combination of the objective function and an appropriate modification of the constraints. Right? So it's the two norm of a squared plus summation i equal to 1 to n of lambda i times 1 minus y i times a transpose x i minus b. Right? And in doing so, I have essentially brought the problem down to the standard form, which is that if I have any constraints, any, any inequality constraints, then they should all be of the form some fi of x less than or equal to 0. Okay, so this is the Lagrangian. And the KKT conditions correspond to the following. So firstly, the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to the variables of interest should all be equal to zero. So it should be a stationary point of the Lagrangian. So gradient of L with respect to A at the optimal point should be equal to zero. So let me call this A star, P star, lambda star. This should be equal to 0, which implies that the gradient of this is 2 times a. Plus summation i equal to 1 to n of lambda i. What is the gradient of this with respect to a? So it's minus lambda i y i exactly. Let me write this as minus lambda i y i x i. This should be equal to zero. So the optimizing a star can be written as summation i equal to 1 to n lambda i star by 2 y i times x right so the optimal a star is in fact just a linear combination of the, the points in the training set so let's keep this aside for now. We'll come back to this later. Similarly, I want the derivative of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian P star lambda star to be equal to zero. What does that give us? Yeah. Right. So summation lambda i y i should be equal to one. Y i. So this is the partial derivative. The so plus. So the summation lambda i y i. This should be equal to zero. Right. All right. 
what are the other conditions so the optimizing a star b star should satisfy all of the constraints so these are, so definitely these constraints have to be satisfied so this two so lambda i y i times a transpose x i minus b should be greater than or equal to 1 for all i what are the other constraints the derivative with respect to the lambda i should be equal to 0 and what does that what will that give us right um so do i really need to take the partial derivative with respect to lambda i and set it equal to 0 These are inequality constraints, but there is one more constraint. Particularly one that holds for inequality constraints. Um, lambda i greater than or equal to 0 yeah so lambda i greater than or equal to 0 for all i so this is one constraint but yeah the most interesting one is that lambda i times 1 minus y i a transpose x i minus b this should be equal to zero right, for all i. So these are the complementary slackness conditions. So, this, in particular, this implies that either lambda i should be equal to 0 or this inequality constraint should be satisfied with equality the ith inequality constraint should be an equality so y i times a transpose x i minus b should be equal to 1 right So now let's let's combine five with one. So we know from one we know that we know that the vector A, our solution is star. So a star is nothing but summation i equal to 1 to n lambda i y i y 2 times x i what does equation 5 tell us whatever it's just this condition is called the complementary slackness condition uh, let's not worry about why it's called the complementary slackness condition. All right, let's just look at this equation. 
when is lambda i star not equal to zero? When the other condition is satisfied, but what does this tell us? Okay. Um, it's equal to one or minus one, or in other words, I also require this to be satisfied. So the sign of this should also be equal to this, um, which which means that mod this quantity is nothing but mod of a transpose x i minus b. But what is that? It is. Yeah. Exactly. It's the distance to between what and what. Correct. Correct. So so it's the distance between x i and the hyper. Correct. And so this would just give me the distance between. Okay, it's not exactly the distance between x i and the hyperplane. Uh, that's there, but uh, let's look at this. So effectively, five uh, gives me that lambda i star equal to. either lambda i star is equal to 0 or mod a star transpose x i minus b star this is equal to 1 okay um but this is not exactly the distance from x i star or this is not exactly the distance from x i to the hyperplane because when we derived the distance from a point to a hyperplane, we assumed that the norm of this vector was equal to 1. Right? So really, the distance between xi to the hyperplane is actually this divided by the norm of a star. Right? Because I have to normalize this by norm of a star. That's effectively normalizing the whole thing by norm of a star. So this is the same as saying a star transpose divided by norm a star times x i minus b star by norm a star. This is equal to 1 divided by norm a star right so what this is saying is that now for a given a star let's say that you fix a particular a star this tells you that lambda i is non-zero only for those vectors x i which lie at exactly this distance from the hyperplane Right. This is independent of x i. So, so any vector that satisfies this will be called a support vector. Which one? That is exactly the margin. Yes. So, lambda i is not equal to 0 if and only if the distance from x i to the hyperplane is equal to 1 by the 2 norm of a star which is exactly the margin. Right. And those vectors
will be called the support vectors. So the optimizing A star is in fact a linear combination of the support vectors. So the picture would look something like this. Suppose this is your A star. So this is my A star x equal to b. And I have a bunch of training points. picture looks something like this. So this is my classifier a star x equal to b star. And I have sort of a region around this where there are no points. And this corresponds to, this is just the margin. Right. All of those points that lie on this, this other hyperplane, which is parallel to my classifying hyperplane, these are the support vectors. So these would be, this is a support vector, this is a support vector, all of these are, it looks like there's a bit of a distance, so. Right, so all of these are the support vectors. And in a sense, the other points don't really matter. So even if I removed all of these vectors from the data set, it wouldn't really change the solution. It still end up with the same solution. All right. So, so these are what I'll call the marginal hyperplanes. So, so the support vectors are those that lie on the marginal height. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's just sort of look at a toy implementation of the same.
again for the purpose of this demonstration i'll use cvxpy for exactly solving um or exactly solving the optimization problem but there are other techniques that we will explore later on okay, so let me first generate a toy data set I want to generate endpoints. Let me assume that the ground truth is something. So a proof. Let me assume that this is a of one comma one. Let's say x plus y equal to or x one plus x two equal to one. That's my ground truth. So that's my concept, right? equals one and so first I need to generate endpoints at random x is set of random points um, two comma n so each point is a vector of length two and y is one but only the points that are below the hyperplane uh, or those which satisfy a times x less than one should be labeled minus so let's look at a two times x less than true these should be labeled minus one say n equal to twenty and Let me plot. Uh, so let me try to plot all of the points, all of the samples that are generated, as well as the classifier, the the, the concept. Two is. Uh, So these are the positive samples, the samples which are labeled plus one, and 
the negative samples, the ones which are labeled minus one. This is what you do. Yeah. Okay, so this is, I mean, the blue line denotes the ground truth. Uh, all of the points that are above this are labeled plus one. The ones that are labeled below this are labeled minus. Here, so So this is what we have. Great. Um, this is pretty close, so let me. This is a bit better. Um, because I see that there is some margin. Okay, so now let's frame the optimization problem and try to solve. Uh, I first have to define the variables over which I'm going to optimize. So it's a vector of A is a vector of length 2, B is a vector of length 1, um, and my objective function is is the two norm of A. Yes, question. And two is I need the constraints, which basically I want that. Let's see, what are the constraints? Constraints are that yi times a transpose xi minus b should be greater than or equal to 1. Cp dot. So the element wise product of the y vector along with a times the x vector minus b, this should be greater than or equal to 1. Right? The problem is basically to. I'm sorry? That's okay, it'll handle. I hopefully it should handle. If not, I'll make it more free and paper. So I want to minimize uh, the objective function subject to the constraint. So I get a solution. Let me see what the solution is.
So I'll also I normalize the solution. So I get something. So it's 0 0.634, uh, comma 0.773, b equal to 0 0.734. Let's let's plot everything and see what it looks like. Well, maybe I print this in red. I'll print the optimal solution in green. So this is what the solution would look like. The red line, in fact, corresponds to the ground truth. Whereas the green line corresponds to the solution that we got from the support vector classifier. Let me take it back here. Let's try to see what is happening here. So this corresponds to our classifier, the solution or the, the support vector machine that we have designed. So if you can see this, effectively this green line is a solution and it looks like these two, maybe three vectors, are the support vectors for this particular classifier on one side. On the other side, it would look like these two vectors might be the support vector. Right? And Ideally, removing any of these vectors should not really affect the solution. Right. Uh, so, we do see that there is quite a bit of a difference between the, the SVM that we have designed and the ground truth. So, in this particular case, we didn't have enough training samples and that is why we got a poor SVM. But, on the other hand, if we did 
take more training samples and run the whole experiment once again say with 50 samples all right i guess that we would really get uh, almost the same hyperplane if we run the optimization problem are almost exactly the same and we also see what the margin is going to be so this is the solution this is the norm of a or norm of a star so the margin is 1 by norm of a star so that's 1 by 100 it's pretty small right any questions Now, one thing to sort of keep in mind is that even though the solution for a given training set is the same, the set of support vectors need not be unique. Right? For instance, I could get the same solution. So, let's take this pictorial example over here. I would end up with the same solution if I took, say, just these four support vectors or let's say these four support vectors as well right so different subsets of support vectors could end up could give me the same solution in the end so even though the optimizer is unique the um the sort of weight is represented as a linear combination of support vectors need not be unique And one of the reasons why that is true is because what this says is that either lambda i, if you go back to the conditions that we had, either lambda i is not equal to 0 or the distance to the hyperplane should be equal to 1 by 2 norm of a, or, or this should be equal to 1, right? It doesn't mean that both of these cannot hold. So, it's possible that for some i, lambda i star is equal to 0 and this is equal to 0 and this is equal to 1. But certainly, if this is not equal to 1, that is, it does not lie in the marginal hyperplane, then definitely lambda i star has to be equal to 0. It cannot be a support vector. So, we can concretely say when a vector is not a support vector, but we can't really say whether a vector has to be a support vector or not, just going by these equations. Okay, so, so now we'll also try to derive a bound on the generalization error uh, for a support vector machine. So we, so we know that the SVM, the hard SVM is in fact an empirical risk minimizer, right? And if we can derive a bound on the generalization error in terms of the VC dimension. But is it possible to estimate the generalization error and is there some relationship between the generalization error and the number of support vectors in fact we'll see that there is we can upper bound the generalization error of a support vector machine in terms of the number of support vectors there are it's a loose upper bound but nevertheless we do have an upper bound all right so first we look at the following uh, loss or error what I call the leave one out error. So, given a training set S, 
the leave one out error is essentially obtained by training. Uh, so you do the following. For every i, you leave out the ith sample. So you get a training set of length n minus 1. And you do empirical risk minimization. Or you construct a support vector machine using just n minus 1 samples. And then you see whether this predicts the ith sample correctly or not. Right? And you take the straight up average over all i. So in fact, you are training n classifiers and testing them on one of those samples which had been left out. So it's 1 over n summation i equal to 1 to n of so you look at the solution that you get you take the training set you remove just the ith sample from the training set from S and train the SVM or your empirical risk you know, or do your empirical risk minimization. The SVM is an ERM, right? That's okay, right? We, sh we showed in the previous class that those two are equivalent. So, the support vector machine is one, so there, there can be multiple empirical risk minimizers. The support vector machine for the realizable case is one of the empirical risk minimizers. Right? We showed that the hard SVM problem, solve the solution to the hard SVM problem is an empirical risk minimizer that maximizes the margin. That's okay, right? That's what that, the constraints exactly say that the the empirical risk should be equal to zero. Like if you go back to the constraints, this says that you want your prediction. So if you if you had to make zero error, then the sign of y i should be the same as the sign of A transpose Xi minus B. So, for you to get zero error, you just need Yi times A transpose Xi minus B should be greater than or equal to zero for all I. So, this is, you can think of this as ERM with an additional constraint. It is an ERM, but in addition to that, I want to minimize something more. I want more conditions. Right. So, so now to get the leave one out error, for every i, I remove the ith sample from the training set and train an SVM. So, I get an SVM that I call H S minus Xi. And I see how this performs on Xi itself. Is it equal to Yi or not? If it's equal to Yi, then great. I don't count anything. If it is not equal to Yi, that is, I misclassify the ith point. If the ith SVM misclassifies the ith point, then I count that as a 1 in the error or a 1 by n in the error. Can you, yeah, correct. The generalization error need not be zero, right? In fact, in our, uh, if you go back to the example that we saw when we had a, right here, right? So in this case, we are after all training on a finite number of samples, right? The ground truth is this red line, but after training, we got this green line. So obviously, the generalization error clearly is not equal to zero, right? Because if I try to test this over a 
मच लार्जर ट्रेनिंग टेस्ट से या इट अचीव जीरो ट्रेनिंग एर बट द जनरलाइजेशन एर एर इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी इक्वल टू जीरो नो दम हा इफ द मार्जिन इज जीरो देन यूर राइट देन द जनरलाइजेशन एर एर वुड बी इक्वल टू जीरो What do you mean? The SVM would return the ground truth only if I mean if the margin is equal to zero. When can the margin be equal to zero? Or let's put it a little more relaxed. When can the margin be arbitrarily close to zero? Yeah, and. when exactly so there's only there's only one hyperplane uh that or you can have multiple hyperplanes but they're almost the same right it's only then that you will have a margin that is arbitrarily close to zero you know when the margin is is close to zero right just by solving for Yeah, you just find you. You just solve for the SVM problem. We're looking at a hypothesis class, right? And we're assuming that the concept comes from this hypothesis class. We're only looking at linear classifiers at this point. I'm not saying that this performs. This is not. This is a good agnostic pack learn. We're doing just pack learning of a concept class. We're assuming that the train that that the set is always linearly separable. Um, SVM is a pack learner, yes, because SVM is an ER. It's not the only ER. to be kept in okay uh that's a very hard thing to say is very yeah potentially but here the real advantage is that you can solve it as a nice convex optimization problem i could come up with more weird linear classifiers or weird learners which can't be implemented efficiently we will look at that in just a little bit I mean that's really the direction that we want to move in here. Yeah. Linear classifier. Amongst all possible linear classifiers, it has to be a hyperplane. Yes. As we have performed so far. Why? <laughs> Not necessarily. So, right? then what other hyperplane could you choose that would uh, like achieve the same level of uh, performance? So, like, zero average, yes, but. Uh, potentially uh just to see the benefit i don't know but that's not a learning algorithm right but how, can you output the ground truth with probability with one even two. yeah close to one <laughs> then we wouldn't be having this course at all <laughs> we wouldn't be talking about svms at all if, we, if there were a way of efficiently finding something which had even lower generalization like okay coming back to the leave one out error so this is how i define the leave one out error any questions regarding the definition okay The nice thing about the leave one error, leave one out error, is that 
this gives you an unbiased estimate of the generalization error of the SV. It's an easy exercise, so I will not prove this, uh, that the expected leave one out error, but this expectation is taken over S, which consists of M or N IID samples. This is equal to the generalization error of the SVM R S R of H S prime, where S prime consists of just of n minus one. I mean, in fact, it, it, this is not restricted to just SVMs. It can be any, uh, in fact, any learning algorithm. This, this, this statement holds true for any learning algorithm for binary classification. Right. So this, so the leave one out error is an unbiased estimate of the uh, the generalization error. But what we can also show is that the leave one out error can be upper bounded by the fraction of um, support vectors or the number of support vectors divided by the number of training samples. When I say it's an unbiased estimate, so this is a random variable. In expectation, this is going to be equal to the generalization error. Correct. Not necessarily, right? I mean, this is one random variable, and you're trying to estimate some other quantity, some other random variable. So, this random variable is an unbiased estimate of this particular random variable. Okay. okay. So, let's consider Let's consider any, uh, let's say, S having prime of self such that, <coughs> so any training set having, say, N samples, <coughs> right? Um, and let's look at the leave one out error. error on this particular training set. Again, for this, I'm I'm assuming that we're we are training a support vector machine. This is 1 by n, summation i equal to n, h, because I ultimately want to bound on the generalization error in terms of the number of support vectors. Exactly. So I want to upper bound the Lee one out error in terms of the number of support vectors. So that's, that, that's how I get an unbiased estimate of, uh, of the generalization or an upper bound in the, of the 
for the generalization error. Yes. XI. Multiple All right. Uh, so let's look at two different scenarios. Uh, so this is so H S minus X I is the support vector machine obtained by training on everything except the ith sum. trained on uh, this minus just the ith sum, right? And HS is the SVM trained on the entire training set, okay? Now, when can you say that HS is equal to HS minus X? Right? So, if X is not a support vector, then HS is going to be uh, equal to HS minus X. Right? So, every time, so for every I such that X is not a support vector, what is the risk that I'm so so what will this quantity be equal to it will be equal to zero right because hs classifies all of the points correctly right hs is guaranteed to classify all of the points correctly so every time xi is not a support vector hs minus xi is equal to hs and therefore it classifies it classifies xi correctly Xi is not a support vector. Okay, let's look at HS. HS is an SV. What is the empirical risk that HS achieves? Zero. It's going to classify every point in S correctly. Okay, so if for some i, HS minus XI is equal to HS, does it classify XI correctly? It's equal to HS. If HS minus XI for some I, suppose that for H, suppose HS minus XI happens to be equal to HS, then would HS minus XI classify XI correctly? It would, it has to, right? Because it's equal to HS and therefore this is equal to YI, correct? So if HS minus XI is equal to HS, then it classifies things perfectly. Right? So that the contribution of HS minus XI to the leave one out error is equal to zero. Okay? Now we don't know what happens if XI is a support vector. Because if XI is a support vector, then removing XI from S could end up giving you a different hyperplane. Correct? So if xi is a support vector, then hs minus xi is not equal to 
HS. You end up with a different hyperplane. Now this hyperplane may classify XI correctly or it may not classify XI correctly. Right? It doesn't matter. That's in the worst case, maybe it classifies it wrongly. Right? So what can you say about the leave one out error for a given training set S? So it's, a, it's the number of support vectors divided by n. And this is an inequality. It need not be equal. It could be strictly less. In fact, it could even be equal to 0. <coughs> divided by n. And I denote this by uh, number of support vectors. It depends on the training set. Which one? Above, okay. Correct. So, so, so this is equal. So this this quantity equal to zero if x is a support. If x if x is not a support vector. No, right? So, so again, everything is computed with respect to this training set only, right? So, let's perhaps go to this example, right? Okay, let's take this particular example. Okay, suppose I so I know that these are the support vectors, right? But now suppose I just remove this from the training set. All right, I just remove this sample from the training set. Then, in this case, I actually end up with the same classifier. Even if it changes, even if it changes, it could be that. I end up with a different classifier, I end up with a different hyperplane, but that different hyperplane could also classify everything correctly in principle. Right? I get a different hyperplane, but I don't know how it may be. Correct. So it's only in that worst case scenario that the Believe one out error is going to be equal to the number of support vectors divided by n. All right. Ah. right. Well, that's it. So you combine this with the previous lemma over here. This is, in fact, going to be equal to less than or equal to the expected number of support vectors divided by n. Which one? For a given S, it's fixed, right? There's no randomness left over. For a given training set, of course, the number of support vectors is the random variable, <coughs> which depends on the training set. Right? So, so in fact, if if you can, if you have a given number of support vectors, then you can treat that as a reasonable estimate of, or a reasonable upper bound on the generalization error. Correct. Which one? Uh, if you have at least correct. Correct. Then the SDM won't be changed. It won't change, yes. Correct. So we can get a much tighter upper. You can. This is again a very loose upper bound. Uh, but if we essentially like have both. Correct. Correct. And the other case of when we have like exactly one support vector. Sure. Each part similar. Yes. So in that case, like uh, we can upper bound it by just you know, like. Uh -huh. uh, and then the other case, 
you have like uh, uh, just one support vector from either positive or negative. Um, so okay, so so let's, let's take a step back. So the re one out error would be equal to zero if there are at least three support vectors on either side. Yeah, on either side, right? Because removing so if you have only two support vectors on either side, then potentially removing one of them could change your hyperplane, right? So. If you had a scenario that looked like this, right? So if you had, say, you have two points here and say two points here, removing this could potentially, and let's say I have another point here and some other points here, removing this particular point would give me a different support vector machine that looks something like that. Right? But on the other hand, if I have say three support vectors on either side, then removing this doesn't really change the hyperplane. Similarly, removing this any one of these doesn't really change. Yes. So that is there only three fighter right? Yes. I just wanted to check because Okay. It is double cooking and I have to take an exam. Okay. Okay, no problem. Please continue till five. Sure. All right. Hopefully that clarifies. Right. Um, so, so in that case, again, when you have at least three support vectors on either side, you can in fact get a better bomb. But, but of course, you have to know how many vectors are there on either side. It's doesn't depend purely on the number of support vectors because I could have, let's say, two support vectors on one side and a hundred support vectors on the other side, which would increase the number of support vectors, but in fact tell you nothing about uh, what the leave one out error could be. Correct, correct. Thinking you, could actually get, like, you can. In fact, there are better upper bounds known, not just in terms of the support vectors, but also the margin you get. Uh, so, in fact, the margin is a that lets you get a much better estimate of the generalization error than just the number of support vectors. But deriving those takes a lot more effort. This is sort of a very simple upper bound that you can very easily derive without much difficulty. A lot of improvements are known. This is really a weak upper bound. But in any case, the other point here is that the leave one out error gives you a good estimate of the generalization. Except that it, you have to train n different support vector machines. So maybe in the next class, I'll uh, talk about um, the case where you don't have a linearly separable set. Uh, you have, so essentially, we are now going into agnostic fact learning. And we'll explore, again, we, we'll see that we can again frame the support vector machine problem in a, in a way we've done previously. But that doesn't really correspond to empirical risk minimization of the zero one loss anymore. It, it's an algorithm and there are different interpretations of the algorithm as an empirical risk of a suitable empirical risk minimizer for a different loss function. Um, but we we'll nevertheless see that it's an efficient way, it's an efficient learning algorithm that does pretty well in practice as well. And it's also rather extensible in the sense that building on that, we'll try to derive efficient non-linear classifiers as well. All right, so let's stop here. Any questions?